What's up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smark Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast. I am your host, Tony Mango, and this is the WWE Money in the Bank 2017 post-show, where I'm going to be recapping what just transpired during the show and giving you my thoughts on everything that happened. And before we get started, let me preface this by saying I did not like this pay-per-view. So if you are not in the mood to hear somebody bitch and complain a little bit, then uh, you're in for a rough night. Because this is going to be a hard podcast for me to do being optimistic about things. There wasn't much of anything at all that I enjoyed about this. Everything that I did enjoy was sort of in mirror image to the worse stuff and it was like well that's good compared to this so I guess that's a highlight that kind of thing if you read my Bleacher Report post of the highlights and the low points you can kind of tell that I'm stretching thin a couple little things for the highlights there because I just didn't like this this was this had a lot more potential than it tapped into And I don't know what exactly the problem necessarily was, but I got to blame it on mostly the writing team out of everything because it seems like this event was just haphazard and just insane with some of the things that they had booked. Like, they didn't want to commit to anything, and they didn't want to stall things, and they didn't want to do things, and they didn't want to... I I don't understand it. Like, for instance, let's start off with the pre-show. It's normal, run-of-the-mill, general rule of thumb that pre-shows just aren't good. And it's very rare that they do things on a pre-show that are actually something that you should check out later on. This was a standard pre-show. None of the segments for the pre-show analysts or, you know, the social media lounge, like, none of that kind of stuff was worth watching. It, 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 there wasn't anything funny going on. There wasn't any actual, like, real deep-down discussion happening. Nothing. This It gave you nothing. And our match was the Hype Bros against the Colognes, which I had mentioned before. I was like, I don't know why they're doing this match, because the Hype Bros could have fought the Ascension. We'll get into that a little bit later on. The Hype Bros versus the Clones has nothing going for it that people would be interested in, except for the fact that Zack Ryder is coming back. And Zack Ryder, even though I'm a fan of him and some other people, such as Dace, like him as well, he's not somebody where it's, you know, you can build a whole big thing around just like, oh my god, Zack Ryder is back. People are going to love this. And Mojo Rawley's not getting much of an audience response. He got enough that when he was doing the he ain't hype kind of thing, some of the people in the crowd were into that, but maybe that's because it was the first match of the night and they just kind of thought that this would be a better pay-per-view or something. I don't know. But um, the Colognes aren't doing a damn thing. They really started off on SmackDown as maybe like, you know, a slight uh, bump upward, and it was like maybe they're actually going to accomplish something. Their feud with American Alpha went nowhere. Their feud with the Fashion Police seems to have been dropped, and now they're going to feud with the Hype Bros. I don't give a shit, do you? That type of mentality of, yeah, but maybe if nobody gives a shit, it doesn't matter, is not good. The writing team in WWE should look at something, they should go, how do we punch this up? How do we make it to where people care? What do we need to do to get people to actually invest in the Hype Bros, or to actually invest in the Colognes, or any of the tag teams? The Fashion Police were able to do it. People like the Fashion Police now, and they did it because they let them do something interesting and entertaining. We haven't seen anything like that from the uh, Colognes, and we haven't seen anything of that from Mojo Rawley as of late. So I don't know if that's because they haven't been given a chance or if that's because they just don't have it in them. But you're not going to get people interested uh, interested in a pre-show match of people that aren't very interesting. And the match was as textbook filler as you can get. Nothing happened. So you did not need to watch the pre-show, which already starts things off with an hour of, meh, you didn't really need to see this. Okay, great. We go into the first match of the night, which was the Women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Charlotte Flair, Carmella, Becky Lynch, Tamina, and Natalia. Honestly, people are going to give me shit for this. This was not a good ladder match. And the reason why I'm saying it isn't good isn't because it's the women's match. I actually thought that this one could have been pretty damn good, and it wasn't. 
we had a stupid spot in this match that took more focus than any other spot of the night for the women's ladder match, at the very least, where it was Becky and Natalia holding a ladder going, it's my ladder. No, it's my ladder. No, it's my ladder. No, I want it. No, I called dibs. No, I said I saw it first, that kind of thing. There's ladders all around you. It doesn't make any sense to be arguing, nor is it fun and entertaining to watch you argue over this. And the big payoff, I was laughing about this ahead of time. I was like, you know, I'm watching there in the basement. Dace is there and a couple other people as well. And I joked and I said, you know, this isn't going to pay off to jack shit. I guarantee you. The big payoff for this, what was it? It was like uh, Becky pushed Natalia to the ground and that was it. Was that really worth it? Not in my mind. <laughs> this is the type of stuff that makes you go, oh, shit. If they didn't have the actual commitment to do a ladder match, they probably shouldn't have done a ladder match at that point. I thought that this was awful in a lot of different ways. Again, it's not something that's like it needed to be a 10 out of 10 match for me to think that it was like, you know, I, I kind of don't uh, subscribe to the same thing that a lot of people do. A lot of people, whether it's movies or wrestling matches or just anything that they're rating, it could be, you know, a dinner at a restaurant. If it's not the best thing ever, they act like it's the worst. I don't do that. I am perfectly fine with something being a C plus, and that means that it's a C plus. It's not the worst thing ever. This was not the worst thing ever. It was just crap compared to what it should have been and what it could have been. It's great that the women's division actually has representation in a ladder match. I think that this is something that they should have done a couple years ago. But if this is the quality of the ladder matches that we're going to be getting, I'm not going to be looking forward to any of them in the future. This was not a good ladder match. Now, there's going to be disagreements as far as my opinion about the uh, the end of the match, but there's positives and there's negatives about this. Now, if you didn't see it and you don't care about me spoiling things and stuff like that, this ended with James Ellsworth climbing the ladder, taking the briefcase off, and then just dropping it down to Carmella. And the referees argued ringside and said, well, does that count? And they essentially went like, eh, sure, why not? Now, after that, we had Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon, or at least as far as their Twitter accounts go, say, that's not right. We're going to address this on, on uh, the next episode of SmackDown. Here's an issue that I have with this. Number one, if you know that the point behind this is going to piss people off, you need to make sure that the way that you follow this up is going to make up for that. I don't know what their plans are. I... At this point, with the way that uh, the rest of Money in the Bank went, I don't have a whole lot of faith that they have a lot of plans that are going to make up for that. Because there are people, I'm not one of them, but there are people that are looking at this and going, well, why did the first ever women's match had to end with a man grabbing the briefcase instead? And why couldn't it have just been Carmella or anybody else actually climbing up the ladder and actually getting it for themselves? And I don't disagree with that 100%. I do think that... To a certain extent, there's an argument there that you can say, like, that kind of sucks that the first ever women's match of some kind had to end with a guy doing the job. I kind of get it, but I don't look at it through that scope. Instead, I look at this as, holy shit, that was funny. James Ellsworth picked it up and just tossed it to Carmella, and she's the type of character that would gloat now and say that she won. If it was a baby face, I'd feel a little bit worse about it. But Ellsworth and Carmella are jokes, and... That kind of works a little bit. I'm interested to see where they go from here. And that's the only part of this ladder match, other than the fact that it happened in general for the women's division, that I liked. Everything else was just... It, one of the words you're going to hear me say a lot with this review is sloppy. This was sloppy. And I don't know if this is a matter of all the women involved couldn't figure out a better match or if they were told that they couldn't really do anything and this was how they, what they had to work with, but I didn't enjoy it. And that continued on throughout almost the entire night. We had the next match after that was the Usos against the New Day for the tag titles. Again, sloppy match. Felt like there were some botches here and there throughout the whole entire thing, and then it ends with a countout. If you've been listening to this podcast long enough, we're almost at 300 episodes now. 
you know that I do not like, under almost any circumstance, DQs and count outs on a pay-per-view. I think that that's such a cop-out because they only do that if they've booked themselves into a corner and they need to stretch something out. It's one thing for somebody to do that on Raw or SmackDown. I still don't like how much they do that on Raw and SmackDown as it is, but that's just the standard free paper... uh, It's the standard free television show. Pay-per-views are supposed to be better than that. They're not supposed to just be episodes of the TV show that happen to happen on Sundays. And the way that they've been booking things ever since that they've done this brand split and the way that they've been uh, booking things since almost the the WWE Network has been more so, meh, it's just kind of like another episode. And that's not good. There needs to be a separation between those two. Usos and the New Day wasn't a good enough match to make up for the fact that that ending was as bad as it was. Because even the count-out ending felt like they weren't sure how to do a count-out ending. And the Usos and the New Day are better than this, too. That's another thing. Just like the women in the ladder match are better than what the match ended up being, these two tag teams can put on one hell of a better match. So I was really disappointed with that, too. Because all this comes out to is... Yeah, we don't want to have the title change hands, but we don't want the New Day to lose. So, how about you wait until next month? That's not good enough. You're a writing team. As writers, you set up situations that you then write the conclusions to. Unless it's a situation that you weren't prepared for, like somebody gets injured ahead of time and you had a tournament planned out. Now, how do you book the tournament? When somebody's injured midway through. That is when you get into a situation where you're kind of like, okay, I'll give them a little bit of leeway. They they had a plan. It was supposed to go A, B, C, D, E, all the way to Z. And by the time they got to F, it was messed up. And then now they need to figure out the rest of the alphabet. Then I'll give you a little bit of slack. This was just, we don't want the titles to change hands, but we already put this match on the card and we can't think of anything else to do. How about we do a count out? So that way the New Day can come out, cut a promo about how they deserve to get another title match because they did technically win. The Usos will say, yeah, but we're going to beat you. And then you can rinse and repeat for the next four or five weeks until we get to Battleground and then something can actually happen. How about instead of that, you just have the New Day win the titles or if they're not supposed to win the titles at Battleground, they don't win the titles and the Usos just win and then you move on. Not that hard. If you brought up enough of the tag teams and you got them to the point where people actually gave a shit, then you could have more options of what you can do. It's not like, well, we only have the Usos and the New Day for the next seven months. That's not the case. The Usos haven't been doing that great, and the New Day is popular as hell to take a feud with anybody. Put the titles on the New Day and then figure it out afterward. I know that it's not going to be, at the very least it shouldn't, the Usos against the New Day both here and and a battleground, and then again on the SummerSlam card, because that is just as lazy as you can get. But I I thought that this was shit. I do not understand the rationality behind the countout. I think if you couldn't figure out another way to do that, you shouldn't have had the match booked. You should know where you're going to go in the future, and you should have a better way to end these matches. Then we had the Naomi and Lana SmackDown Women's Championship match, which... I'll give credit to one thing when it comes to Lana. Her in-ring performance wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, and she looked great in her outfit. But she still has a long way to go, and the match was not all that impressive. And then, on top of that being messy, they had Carmella come out, kind of cash, it, uh, kind of tease a cash in, but choose not to, which I'm sort of on the fence about because it's sort of like, I get it, and I don't dislike it. But it also just sort of felt weird that she did that because it didn't result in a distraction where Naomi lost the belt. It was almost like, I'm going to distract you, but just enough that you can not be distracted. And then it's a non-entity of a situation. That was a weird choice. If you were going to have Naomi lose to Lana, then Carmella causing that distraction, Lana getting the pin... Lana winning the title, and then Carmella cashing in on Lana or something, that I can understand. 
but her to do a distraction that doesn't work felt strange. We have, after that, a Fashion Police segment making fun of Miami Vice. This was great. I thought it was funny. They've got their old cell phone. It's this property of Paul E. They're confused about the fax machine and stuff. And then they have these people come in and they say uh, on the VHS tape, we're the people that uh, trashed your office and we're going to fight you in the ring tonight. And it was like, oh, the Ascension did. Okay. Pretty obvious. Whatever. Not excited for that one, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. Then we get Mike Bennett and Maria come out, which in essence, it's a good thing because that means that one of the SmackDown's problems was that they didn't have any mid-card heels. Now they've got a mid-card heel because this guy shouldn't just go straight to the main event. Come on. I don't know too much about Mike Bennett, but I've heard a lot of great things, so I'm interested to see where he's got uh, like his potential going forward. And kind of funny... I'm kind of funny. I kind of find it funny that they're going by Mike and Maria Canellis because now he's taking on her last name, that kind of thing. Um, the promo, though, not that good. <laughs> Maria has never been really that great on the mic. And their whole the power of love thing dragged on a little bit long. And I can kind of understand where they're going here because they kind of want to be like another Miz and Maurice, but it's not as engaging. So I hope that they punch it up. And that they kind of get a little bit more energy to it and a little bit, I don't know, something that's just, it's missing something. That's for sure. I don't want to see this exact same segment again on Tuesday night. And I'm almost 100% sure we're going to. So that's going to be frustrating. Because WWE does do that from time to time where they'll be like, yeah, we need you to cut the same promo for the first like five weeks that you're there so people can kind of... If they missed it the one week, they'll get it this week, and we want to really beat them over the head with this one idea, and that's all you can do. I have a feeling this is going to be very frustrating going forward, but I don't know for sure, and I always thought Maria was hot, and I've heard a lot of good things about Mike Bennett. So the fact that they have another mid-card heel on SmackDown is a good thing, and the fact that the women's division has another woman on there is a good thing. Just a matter of, let's see what happens in the future. This particular segment, not all that great. So, you're off to a mediocre start, I would say. Heard a lot of good things. There's a lot of potential. Not uh, tapping into that yet. (laughs) Then, we have our WWE Championship match. And, I don't know if I'm on board with Jinder Mahal retaining or not at this point, it kind of depends on where they're going to go in the future, but I'll withhold my judgment on that until we see what they're going to do for battleground. And even more so what we're going to do for SummerSlam. It's a possibility. I'm going to look back on this and I'm going to go, God damn it. Why didn't they have the title change? But I'm not going to jump to that conclusion yet. However, what I will rag on is the ending of this match, just the same as some of the other ones, was problematic. If you went through earlier in the night the idea of the referee uh, doing a count out, why was there no count out on this one? The referee just stands there, watches Randy Orton fight the Bollywood boys, and that's another thing too, all right? So... Uh, Mike Kyoto, the referee, says to the Singh brothers, nope, nope, you got to leave. They didn't leave at all. Instead, they go and they pick a fight with these legends ringside. Who were the legends? Well, we've got Cowboy Bob Orton and nobody else matters. That's essentially what it was. Uh, if you really want to know who the people were, it was Sergeant Slaughter, Ric Flair, Greg Gagne, Larry the Axe Hennig, and Baron Von Roschke. I am pronouncing that correctly. I had absolutely no idea who that was to me. That was like, I, I don't know this guy at all. Um, so I'm, I know the people right now that are very, very astute when it comes to old classic wrestling are going to be like, oh my God, what do you mean you didn't know? Yeah, I don't know that guy. Sorry. Uh, I totally recognize uh, Larry the Axe, Bob Orton, Flair, etc. Did not know who that Baron guy was. But they served no purpose whatsoever. Cowboy Bob Orton being ringside, okay, he did. 
they didn't need to do this whole thing with the Singh brothers, but for some reason they thought that that was a good enough way for them to do it, and it was like, all right, fine, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of leeway when it comes to that. I wouldn't have booked that as the end of the match, but if you're gonna do that, why have the other legends ringside? Why not just have Cowboy Bob Orton? Because the other legends ringside watching this, it felt awkward. Ric Flair standing there going, hey, hey, don't touch him or I'll stand here. And it was like, well, you're these legends. Fucking fight back or a little bit or something. Or you're not going to look like you're actually legends because you're just sitting there going, we're a bunch of frail old men and we don't want to do anything. I thought that that was stupid. And Randy Orton going nuts and flipping out ringside and then it was just like oh my god can you please just go into the ring and fucking lose the match already because that's all that we're setting up here is that you're gonna walk in and get your self planted down into the ring and then Jinder Mahal is gonna retain just do it two minutes later just do it already for fuck's sake and then he goes ahead and he does it and it's like all right well that's one of the cynicisms of watching wrestling for long is you see the same type of finishes and you can tell where they're going and then it's frustrating to watch them drag their ass to get to that point because you're just like, all right, tell me what the next segment is already. I know General Hall is going to retain. Move on. When we do move on, we get the Fashion Police versus the Ascension, which I'm very glad that the Fashion Police got on the card, but they're feuding with the Ascension now and the Ascension are crap. They've never given the Ascension anything worthwhile, and I doubt that they're going to do now. So I have no investment in this at all. If that was the big payoff to this whole idea of the office being trashed, that wasn't a good enough payoff. <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to say? This was a filler match, and it wasn't good. It, I mean, I, I, when I say it wasn't good, I'm not saying like, well, this didn't serve the purpose of being a filler match. It did. For this to be a bathroom break, it was a bathroom break. People didn't need to watch it. But is anybody going to remember this match in three weeks? Maybe even by the end of the night, people won't remember that it happened, and that's sad. Fashion police deserve better. I'd even argue that the Ascension deserve better. I don't know. Not a big fan of this whole thing. Finally, we had our Money in the Bank ladder match for the men's side. Baron Corbin, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, AJ Styles, Shinsuke Nakamura, and Dolph Ziggler. And it starts off with Shinsuke Nakamura being attacked in his entrance, which got me very nervous. Because I, again, you know, you watch wrestling enough, you know that he's going to come out later on. If they would have said, well, we need a replacement, and Rusev would have popped up, then I would have been like, oh, okay, that's why they wanted to do that. But instead, I'm sitting there going, ah, crap, Nakamura is going to come out, and I'm worried that he's going to win it. Because I like Nakamura, but he should not be Mr. Money in the Bank right now. I'm very, very happy that this was not only the best match of the night, as far as I'm concerned, but I'm also happy that Baron Corbin won instead of Shinsuke Nakamura because I do think that Baron Corbin deserves it more than Nakamura at this point. I would argue that Baron Corbin doesn't deserve it as much as uh, Kevin Owens or AJ Styles or Dolph Ziggler even. But, you know, I kind of d- like to do that whole win the mid-card title first type of thing. And WWE doesn't follow that rule all the time. It's not a necessity. You don't have to do it with everybody. But I don't know what they're going to be doing with the future of the WWE um, Championship. And Baron Corbin might be holding on to this for quite a while. I don't know. I did get worried, though, that Nakamura would win it. And the fact that he didn't and that they had sort of set Baron Corbin up as like, well, he can't win it now because they're setting him up to look like he's going to win. That kind of thing sort of subverted that expectation a little bit. So, yeah, this was not... um, A ladder match that I'm going to be looking back on and going like, oh man, some crazy things happened there. This was so memorable. It wasn't. This was a lackluster kind of money in the bank. But for this pay-per-view, this was one of the best parts of the entire night. And I don't know. Take uh, take that how you want to take it. I thought that this was a crap pay-per-view with very confusing booking elements. And doesn't give me a whole lot of faith that they know what they're doing when it comes to Battleground. I originally was going to buy tickets for Battleground. It's in Philly. So that's right around my neck of the woods. And I don't think I'm going to now. (laughs) That sucks, you know. I might still, if I can find them cheap enough, if a bunch of us are going or something, I might still do it. But I'm just not excited. And I like... uh, I liked SmackDown going into Money in the Bank more than I did with this whole idea of Great Balls of Fire. So, 
I'm kind of looking at this as like, well, this isn't really a good stretch of time going on here. Extreme Rules was flat and boring, and Money in the Bank failed, and I'm not excited about Great Balls of Fire yet. Then we got Battleground, which might suck. I don't know. You better deliver for SummerSlam at this point. And if WWE's idea of delivering for SummerSlam is to see Braun Strowman get his ass kicked by Brock Lesnar and to waste John Cena and Roman Reigns, then I'm not interested. You know, I'll be watching. I'm always watching. I mean, I got a fucking website, so I might as well uh, not just abandon the damn thing. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to be a happy camper over these couple of weeks because I'm getting very frustrated with the way that WWE is just phoning it in. And it's uh, it's not good. You know, you should be enjoying this stuff more. And I'm sure there's people out there that are enjoying it more than I am. And for you guys and girls, awesome. I'm glad that you are. Maybe try to share some of those opinions about what you liked about it. Don't just be like, you're fucking wrong. uh, Because that's not going to change my mind. But, you know, explain to me what you liked about it. What, What were the positives out of that women's ladder match that you think I'm skipping out on. Did you really think that it was good to do a count out for the tag titles? You know, like uh, whatever situations that you might disagree with me on, let's have a spirit of debate in the comments and see what's happening. But as far as I'm concerned, Money in the Bank sucked. And I'm going to have to add this down into my list of one of the most disappointing pay-per-views of the year so far. I thought it could have been good. And I don't even think that it was C-. minus. Uh, I think that this was a D pay-per-view. So... With that in mind, um, if I'm going to go biggest highlight and biggest low point, biggest highlight, I guess, is going to be Lana's outfit. And my biggest low point, uh, I mean, maybe the Legends things, maybe, I I guess just, if I can lump it all into one, just the endings. Almost none of these... Wait, did any of them actually end normally? We had James Ellsworth. We had the count out. We had the weird cash-in that isn't a cash-in. We had the Legends distraction thing. Maybe the Fashion Police had a normal ending. I don't even fucking remember at this point. Eh, The endings and the booking. That's the biggest low point, just in general. So that's it then for the post-show for this. Uh, sorry I couldn't be a little bit more chipper, but that's what happens when you give me something that I'm not really all that into. Uh, we will be popping up next on the hot tags. I'll probably be recording that Monday night, then doing the Ask Him and that kind of stuff. Probably still Monday night, too. So if you're listening to this on Monday, try to answer the Ask Him ahead of time. And our main event for this next episode of Smack Talk is going to be a double edition of Call the Spot for the different people that were in the Money in the Bank ladder matches. So that might be Wednesday or so. And then I'm going to be taking Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off because I uh, am turning 30 on Saturday. And I don't want to fucking work. (laughs) I think I deserve myself a little bit of time off to not have to work my ass off, so... Um, nothing more when it comes to that. I'm probably not even going to be doing any kind of articles and stuff for those couple of days. But in the meantime, those are the next times that you're going to be, uh, hearing my voice and seeing me and stuff. So if you want to be aware of when those videos go up, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell icon, and then check off that you want the notifications. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Smart Out Moment to get notifications for not just the videos, but the articles on the website. And that'll do what's in for this edition of the Pay-Per-View Point. Thanks for watching and listening, everybody. This has been another Smart Out Moment, and I'm being counted out.